Thank you to the Wiley family. Also passed last month, resolution commending the Bryce Funeral Home upon the occasion of its 100th anniversary. Presentation by the minority. So we have uh, Craig Bryce with us and his girlfriend, uh, Lynn Krill, uh, Craig's nephew, David Kelly, uh, excuse me, David Cluett, and his wife, Kelly, uh, with us. We thank you for coming. So I'm going to read the resolution um, commending Bryce Funeral Home upon the occasion of his 100th anniversary. Whereas a community is only as great as its members who provide exemplary leadership and service and who, through personal and professional dedication, contribute to the fabric and climate of Rensselaer County, and whereas attendant to such duty and fully in accord with its longstanding traditions, it's the intent of this legislative body to convey its compliments to the Bryce Funeral Home for serving its community for 100 years. And whereas the Bryce Funeral Home was founded in 1917 at 2188 Fifth Avenue in the living quarters of the late Lowell H. and Evelyn Merrick Bryce. And whereas in 1936, Lowell purchased a beautifully appointed brownstone at 1820 Fifth Avenue in downtown Troy. A large mahogany paneled parlor offered their clientele the first casket display room in Troy. In 1947, when their son L. Merrick Bryce joined the business, they purchased the building next door at 1818 Fifth Avenue, which afforded its growing clientele an additional parlor. And whereas in 1959, Lowell and his son Merrick also purchased the DeGraff Funeral Home in West Sand Lake, which was founded in 1910 by J. Elwin and Anna Rabel DeGraff. A new funeral home was built and renamed DeGraff Bryce Funeral Home. And whereas in the 60s, as urban renewal changed the dynamics of the city of Troy, the Bryce Funeral Home relocated to its present location at the corner of Pauling and Maple Avenue. The funeral home is a manor style house with oak woodwork, high ceilings, and a stained glass and stained glass windows. Fireplaces and soft lighting create a soothing ambiance for grieving families. And whereas Helen H. Bryce and her son L. Craig Bryce joined the firm in the 70s, continuing with their business motto, How We Do Our Work Matters, which has served them well for the past three generations. And whereas Al Merrick passed away on June 3rd, 2006, and Helen Bryce on July 20th, uh, 2015. In 2007, a fourth generation began its tenure at the funeral home when David Merrick Cluett uh, became a licensed funeral director. Now, therefore, be it resolved that in accordance with the tradition of this legislative body, to recognize those individuals whose superior achievements have contributed to the vitality of this community, we hereby extend grateful appreciation to the Bryce Funeral Home, and be it further resolved that the clerk of the legislature is hereby directed to transmit an engrossed copy of this resolution to the Bryce Funeral Home. So, 100 years of service to the community. Uh, the minority, we, uh, we um, 
wanted to recognize the funeral home because we're all, we're all from Troy. And I think I'm speaking today because when I was married, funeral business. So I kind of understand the business and I understand the kinds of sacrifices people make um, who work for um, a funeral business. I know my, uh, at the time my husband went and got a, uh, his license to be a funeral director when we had an infant. And it just seems that every time that phone would ring, um, it would be in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, like our, uh, our doctors and our firefighters and our police and EMTs, they're on call 24-7 and their life is put on hold many times. I know that firsthand. So um, I'm sure most of you know where Craig, uh, the Bryce Funeral Home is on, on Pauling and Maple. It's, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous building, and I'm sure you're getting ready to decorate for, uh, for Thanksgiving. Do we have something up in the tower? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to make one more comment, which is kind of funny. I've gotten into watching um, repeat Columbo mysteries on television, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. And this past Sunday, I taped it and watched it, and it had to deal with a funeral home. Um, and the director of this funeral home, who ends up being the murderer, happens to um, receive an award from the Funeral Directors Association. And because I taped it, I was able to go back and replay it. And I, I thought to myself, here I'm going to be presenting a resolution. And I quickly wrote down what this funeral director said to his fellow funeral directors. And he said, and, and I found it quite telling, he said, some of us call ourselves funeral directors, but I prefer the old fashioned word undertaker. Um, because I undertake the pain of the bereaved that they cannot bear. And I thought, oh, that's so, so appropriate. Because um, I always thought funeral directors sounded a little classier than, than undertaker. But after I heard that, I replayed it and I wrote it down and I thought, you know, your business is based on trust and compassion and doing the right thing, as you say. And, you know, I applaud, I applaud your, uh, your business. 100 years of excellent service. Would anyone else like to speak? I've spoken for way too long. Okay. Well, I'm going to, we have our engrossed copies here. Yes, would anyone in the family like to say anything? Um, it's interesting that in, in the proclamation was the, uh, um, the expression, how we do our work matters. That motto um, was actually given to my grandfather when he started this business a hundred years ago by um, Harry Carlton who ran Trojan Hardware, and, well actually his father, and um, Mr. Sim who ran Sims. And we've got a sign in our, in our office that's still hanging that's the real, no, no robbers in here I assume, the, it, it's, the, it's the real gold inlay that's in this huge frame that has how we do our work matter. So my f grandfather didn't even make up that motto. These other people did instead. But it is, it, it is interesting because we've, we've, we've lived by that. And um, uh, my grandfather started at Jacob and Fifth, um, and um, he moved from there to the Fifth Avenue, the 1825th Avenue, which is right near the Troy Record. Um, and Urban Renewal took that block and then we moved up to Pauling Avenue. My father's comment was always, I hope they don't tear this building down. They've torn down everything else that I started in. But it's been, uh, it's been, a, it's been wonderful. It really has been. And having uh, his, his great grandson now is you know, just a, a dream come true. Thank you very much.
Thank you to the Bryce Funeral Home and what you do for our community. Also passed last month, P40717, resolution commending Bell and Appley upon the occasion of its 60th anniversary. Another mm -hmm. presentation by the minority. And uh, families and accomplishments seem to be the, the rule of the night here. And uh, it's my honor to present this resolution to the family of the Bellinopoly Bakery on the occasion of their 60th anniversary. And uh, I'd like to read the resolution. And whereas a community is only as great as its members who provide exemplary leadership and service and who through personal and professional dedication contribute to the fabric and the climate of our county. And whereas attendant to such duty and fully in accord with its longstanding traditions, it is the intent of this legislative body to convey its compliments to the Bellinopoly Bakery upon the occasion of their 60th anniversary. And whereas in 1957, a young man from Naples, Italy, John V. Manella, opened his bakery in a vacant storefront on River Street in Troy. Having learned, learned the trade from the Royal Bakery on Jefferson Street in Troy, New York, his initial bakery products included Italian bread, pizza dough, and submarine rolls. And whereas after his first year in the business, John's brother Michael also joined the new family business, after having also worked at the Royal Bakery. And whereas John's wife Phyllis and his children Dominic, Gino, Mario, and Victoria all have had an active role in the business. And whereas in 1982, Dominic, John's eldest son, opened the bakery's second location on Route 9 in Latham. The Bellinopoly Bakery Sandwich and Coffee Cafe. The business grew rapidly, exceeding their expectations, and the family managed to quickly adapt to these inevitable cha challenges. And whereas today, 60 years later, the family still produces an ever-expanding array of Italian and American baked goods. Their reputation for quality and unmistakable tastes draws many customers from different counties to purchase their signature cannolis and many other breads and pastries. So therefore, be it resolved that in accordance with the tradition of this legislative body to recognize those individuals whose superior achievements have contributed to the vitality of this community we hereby extend grateful appreciation to the Manila family and the Bellinopoly Bakery. Um, Bellinopoly Bakery, uh, for anybody that's from Troy, I mean, it's, 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 it's the bakery. I mean, it's almost like you don't even have to call it by name. The, uh, uh, particularly for me and for some members of the minority here. Um, I grew up right near the Bellinopoly Bakery. I can almost remember when it opened, but I won't go back that far in age. The, uh, but it's more about what they are. I mean, this family is kind of like a, a perfect example of the American dream. I mean, they came, they worked hard, they did well. They left a legacy of a business for their children, hopefully for their grandchildren to come. Um, it's really the, the American dream. And Along with that, uh, I've had the pleasure of, with, with Dominic um, being involved in St. Patrick's and it wasn't just about being a uh, contributing business, it was also about the business contributing to its community. They've always kind of been there as a reach out into the community as well and it's, it's just, it's a win-win for the whole community. Uh, the, it's so funny, I was at work today and it was someone's birthday and uh, our boss brought in um, 
baked goods. And sure enough, it was two boxes of, of you know, uh, assortment of cupcakes and cannolis and cheesecakes from the, from the Bellinopoly. And this person had just started working here a couple of months ago, but already it is the person's go-to bakery um, living in the city of Troy. So I just want to congratulate this family and it's, a, it's an honor to. I have known them for many years. I've worked, done business with them when I worked at the Old Daily Inn and uh, it's, it's just an honor. And would any other legislators like to say something? No? Okay. Would you like to say something? Sure. Peter, thank you. And thank you, uh, Rensselaer County uh, legislators. Um, my dad passed away about four and a half years ago, and uh, and um, and I think he would have been very proud to, if he was here today to stand here. My mother couldn't be here today. And my sister Victoria, my mother Phyllis, and my sister Victoria could not be here today. Uh, when my parents started, they started on the corner of Hutton and River Street, down in Troy, across from uh, Kluitz. And my father and another helper would uh, make the bread during the, uh, during the night, and in the morning he would deliver. And my mother would watch us, we used to live on the third floor, and my mother would watch us, watch the kids, me, Gino, my sister Victoria. And you talk about, you, you talk about persistence, and my father would be out there delivering, the store would be closed, she'd be watching us upstairs, and, at, and somebody would ring the doorbell, my mother would come down and sell one loaf of bread, and go back up, and she would do this continuously throughout the whole day. Until, she, until the store was closed. And, um, and I knew that, I knew that, I knew that, um, that knowing this, that for our generation, the sacrifices that they made, it has to continue on through our generation and hopefully into the future generations. And I'm sure it will too. And um, from that point on, then they went up to River Street in Troy. And it was just bread and rolls and, um, People were inquiring about sweet goods. So I have to tell you a quick a little story about, <clears throat> my father took an ad in the New York City paper looking for an Italian pastry, guy, pastry, a pastry chef. It was a, an older fellow. He came up, he drove all the way from New York. He goes and sees my father. My father didn't have a stove. He didn't have a refrigerator. <laughs> he didn't have any utensils. He didn't have anything, just, just the mixer for his bread and rolls. Well, they got in this heated discussion real bad, and he was ready to walk out and drive all the way back to New York. So my father says, no, listen, let's do this. I'll go down to New York with you. Let's buy the stove. Let's buy all the utensils. Let's buy the ingredients. I want you to come back up here to Troy and make the Italian pastries. And that's how he started with the Italian pastries. And then he would hire, he would hire other bakers from, from the area. And he would say, just, you know, just make something and sell it. Let's see how it goes. You know, if that works, that's fine. If it doesn't, it's okay too. So the business flourished in that, in that respect. So even today, you'll see a wide variety of products in there because we still do that for the bakers. So they don't get confined in one mm -hmm. little routine. They're able to be creative and they're able, <coughs> you know, able to contribute to the bakery. Now, I can go on and on about the bakery, but I just want to say thank you for the resolution and um, uh, you know we're 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 grateful to our for for our customers. We're grateful to our for our employees, and uh, I'm I'm just honored and humble to be part of Rensselaer County and and Troy's history. And I know that we're going to be still part of it in its future. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
There you go, sir. Thank you. So when in Troy, don't be afraid to stop into Bellinapoli and get your favorite treats. Thank you for your service, family. <clears throat> also passed last month is P417, Resolution in Memoriam of Gordon A. McNeely. Presentation by myself, Legislator Wysocki, and Legislator-elect, I think, Petiri is here if he'd like to join. And I know there's members from the McNeely family. Is the season. <clears throat> Thank you to the McNeely family for attending tonight. As it was mentioned, we passed this resolution last month in memory of Gordon McNeely, and it is consistent with the duty of this legislative body to pay honor and respect to persons who have had a great impact and influence on Rensselaer County during their time on this earth. We remember with deepest respect and admiration of the life of an individual whose singular example enriched the lives of their family, friends, and fellow citizens. <clears throat> and whereas attendance is such duty and fully in accord with its longstanding tradition, it is, is the intent of this legislative body to express the sincere sorrow upon the death of Gordon A. McNeely, which occurred the 31st day of July of the year 2017. Whereas Gordon was born in Bennington, Vermont, the son of the late Alexander McNeely in County Down, Ireland, and Ida Peterson of Kaskrone, Sweden. And whereas Gordon grew up in Hoosick, where he loved outdoors, spending the warmer days walking in the woods and skating in the winter. And whereas a teenager, uh, Gordon was the groundkeeper for the Colgate Estate in Bennington, Vermont. And whereas January 1943, Gordon was drafted in the United States Army, where he served as a radio operator with the Battery 242 Field Artillery and bravely fought fascist tyranny in Europe, beginning being honorably discharged in December of 1945. And whereas after his military career, Gordon explored various fields before obtaining employment with Dodge Fibers, later Oakland Industries, and was co-owner of McNeely's Greenhouse for many years. If many of you travel up that way, it's right on the Vermont border, on the edge of Hoosick, and with his sisters Lillian and dear friends Lyman and Ruth Rudd. And whereas Gordon married Alice Welsh in 1947, and whereas Gordon was a volunteer firefighter with the Hoosick Fire Department, and he served as the fire commissioner for the Hoosick Fire District. And whereas in addition to his wife, Gordon is survived by his daughters, Carol and husband Timothy, Kathleen, husband Kevin, his grandchildren Kate, Eric, Michael, Sarah, Rachel, Zachary, Gregory and Brian, his great grandchildren, Wyatt, Owen, Tyler, Toby and Annabelle. Gordon was predeceased by his sister Lillian Spendiff. Now therefore be it resolved that the Rensselaer County Legislature concludes its Deliberations in memory of Gordon A. McNeely. So Gordon was a, a, a main staple in the Hoosick Hamlet. Uh, the, Hoosick has its own uh, post office. It's right there if you, if you know where the Big Moose is now in Hoosick. Uh, attached to the Big Moose is the post office. Um, 12089 is its zip code. So 
on many a day you would see Gordon and Alice at the post office holding court. Of course, that was where Charlie Williams and the rest of them hung out and the mayor of Hoosick. But on a given day, you would see either they're sitting on their porch on County Route 95 heading into Hoosick or walking to the post office or the store, like every day. But uh, Gordon was quite a guy and he gave back to his community and he served his country well. And we thank you for sharing him with us and thank you for his service. And it's a pleasure for us and for me and Jeff and Bruce to honor Gordon this evening. And I have copies of this suitably engrossed resolution. I'd just like to say thank you to the legislature for um, this recognition of my dad. Um, he was a very humble person and I think would be astounded that we're here doing this this evening. Um, but we're deeply grateful that um, the kind of person that he was and the contributions that he made have been recognized. Thank you very much. Thank you to the McNeely family once again. Also passed last month, P44217, the resolution memoriam of Constance Burkhart. Presentation by Legislator Loveridge, Bressler, and Shannon. And any other legislator elect from that district would like to join? They may. This legislature regularly uh, shows our respect and admiration to members of our community who have contributed so much to so many. <clears throat> this evening here we, we want to recognize Constance Burkhart, a wonderful person from Sand Lake, Averill Park area. I have a resolution which I'd like to read. Whereas it is consistent with the duty of this legislative body to pay honor and respect to persons who have had a great impact and influence on Rensselaer County during their time on earth. We remember that deepest respect and admiration the life of an individual whose regular singular example enriched the lives of their family, friends, and fellow citizens. And whereas attendant to such duties and fully in accord with its long-standing tradition, it is the intent of this legislative body to express its sincere sorrow upon the death of Constance Burkhart, which occurred on the 11th day of August of the year 2017. And whereas Constance was the daughter of the late doctor and Mrs. Charles A. Smith, and whereas Constance Burkhart was an employee of the Averill Park School District for 22 years, and whereas Constance was very active in her community serving as the president of the Twin Town Little League, the youth program supervisor for the town of Sand Lake, president of the Sand Lake Miller Hill PTA, and president of the Non-Instructional Employees Association. 
And whereas Constance enjoyed reading, gardening, and hummingbirds, and whereas the, in addition to her dear husband, Ernest Burkhart Jr., Constance is survived by her loving children, Ernie and Laura, her granddaughter Elizabeth, her daughter-in-law, Lisa Bell Burkhart, her guardian angel sister, Mary Celestine, and her family, her brother Larry, Betsy, her sister Nancy, Mike, as well as many nieces and nephews. Constance was predeceased by her sister Carol and her brother Charles. Now therefore be it resolved that the Rensselaer County Legislature conclude its deliberations in memory of Constance Burkhart to extend its deepest sympathy to her family, fully confident that her contributions to her community will live on to serve as an inspiration to all and be it further resolved that the clerk of the legislature transmit a copy of this resolution suitably engrossed to the family of Constance Burkhart. Thank you very much. She has done so much for her community. And I wanted to, uh, Judy, would you like to say anything? I just want to say a few words. I did not know Connie, but the week that she died, um, I was in the grocery store, and people started asking me, did you hear about Connie Burke? And then I was in the post office, and I was asked again, did you hear about Connie Burke? And then neighbors started to ask me the same. And I felt I had a loss in my life because I never got to know Connie Burke. And I want to thank you, the whole family, for all the contributions she did to the town of Sand Lake. Thank you. Thank you. Legislator-elect, Scott, would you like to say a couple of words? So I didn't know that I'd be saying anything tonight, but I'm glad to say something. And, um, you know, Bob said a lot of stuff about Connie, and, um, you know, she was really uh, an incredible woman. She, you know, when, when the way that they said about her starting, I, I, the, non the president of the Non-Instructional Employees Association, what that actually was was she started a union. And you know, she had the courage to do that, and probably had even more courage to be the president of the Twin Towns Little League. I don't know many women that would have the courage to take on that job. It seems to be uh, quite a challenge, I know, for anybody. Um, but you know, she's like like these guys said. You know, we've we've had some incredible people honored, gentlemen living to a hundred years and being a legislator and doing all those things. But I'll tell you, the one thing that I know about Connie, and. Um, is that her family was everything. She was, uh, like, like Bob said, she was the daughter of uh, really an iconic man, Doc Smith. And uh, when her sister passed away, she became the matriarch of her family. And um, you know, for everybody, she uh, was really just a great person. And what I loved about her also was during Halloween, which we just passed Halloween, everybody in our town, because we live in a rural area, tends to congregate and some of these neighborhoods that have a little bit more uh, of a population than one which is so is Edgewood Avenue across from the high school. And if you go to Averill Park, you'll see literally hundreds of people there. And uh, she never disappointed any of the kids there. Um, so I just think, I I'm just grateful to be able to be here tonight and watch all these people and businesses be honored. And I'm just especially thrilled to be able to be here for uh, Connie Burkhart. So thank you. Would anyone from the family like to say a few words? Yeah, this is a great honor. Uh, the Rensselaer County Legislature uh, putting together this resolution <clears throat> for Connie, and she's in great company. Uh, we talked about businesses, and uh, now you have something with family. Um, getting back to her dad, he, he was pretty iconic, too. Um, he built his own camp on the third lake at Burden Lake, 1947. The building is still there. Uh, as kids, as uh, young teenagers, uh, we would go out to Bird Lake in the summertime. And uh, when we got married, we settled in Avril Park. We specifically took that area because it just I still love it. We moved in uh, 1974, and we're actually in this, I'm in the same house that uh, we moved into there. And um, these accomplishments, um, they don't say everything uh, what she was to me and our family, and Ernie, my, my daughter Laura, 
And uh, this is my backup here, my posse. That's what I call my posse. But uh, what a great honor tonight, and I just want to thank you all for doing this for us. I'll never forget it either. Thank you, Bob. Okay, I have a, anyone else? No. Okay. I have a copy of the resolution for the family. Thank you to the Burkhart family once again. Also passed last month, P4431317, resolution adjourning the October 10th, 2017 legislative meeting in memory of Francis Heiser. Presentation by Legislator Walsh, Harrington, and Tessman. We have a resolution uh, adjourning the October 10th, 2017 legislative meeting in the, uh, in the memory of uh, Francis Heiser. Whereas it's consistent with the duty of this legislative body to pay honor and respect to persons who have a, a great impact and influence on Rensselaer County during their time on this earth. We remember with the deepest respect and admiration the life of the individuals who singularly example and riches of the life of their family, friends, and fellow citizens. And whereas attended to such duty and fully accord with this long-standing tradition, it is the intent of this legislative body to express a serious sor sorrow for the death of Francis Heiser, which occurred on the 13th day of August in the year 2017. And whereas Francis was born in uh, Fountain Hill, Pennsylvania to the late Frank and Anna Heiser. And whereas Fran was, was a graduate of Catholic Central High School in Allentown, Pennsylvania, Lehigh University and of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where he earned his bach uh, Bachelor of Science in Metallurgy, and RPI in Troy, where he earned his Master's in Metallurgy, metallurgy and Lehigh University where he earned his PhD. Whereas Francis was stationed with the U.S. Army at the Waterloo Arsenal and then served eight years in the National Guard in Cohoes and Troy. And whereas he retired from an A laboratory after 40 years of service. And Frank, uh, Fran was a coach with the youth sports and member of the Town of Brunswick Youth Commission in the 1890s. He was a communicate, communicate and uh, lecturer and a Eucharistic, Eucharistic minister for the former Francis de Sales Church and later the communicate of the Lady uh, of our Lady of Victory Church. And whereas in addition to his wife of 61 years, Teresa, 
France is survived by four children, Karen, Stephen, Brian, and Thomas. Eight grandchildren, Matthew, Jared, Mackenzie, Molly, Michael, Jack, Emma, and Charlie. His brother, Anthony, as well as several nieces, and nephews, and cousins. He is preceded by his brother, Raymond Heiser. Now for it be it resolved that the Rensselaer County Legislature conclude its deliberations in memory of Francis Heiser to the extent its deepest sympathy, to extend its uh, deepest sympathy, sympathy to his family, fully confident that his contributions to his community will live on to serve as an inspiration, inspiration for all, and further resolve that the clerk of the legislature transmit a copy of this resolution suitably engrossed to the family of Francis Heiser. I've known Fran for a long time. I, uh, I served in the National Guard with him. Uh, when I first met him, he was a captain, and he served on the, uh, the brigade staff. I was in the, in the brigade uh, headquarters company at that time. And I always asked him, I said, Fran, I knew he worked at the arsenal. I said, how do you get to work at the arsenal? He said, well, you have to go take an exam with the civil service, otherwise you can't get in there. So eventually I, I, I got in there. But Fran was uh, very deep in the, his job at the arsenal, and he wound up to be the director of the research and engineering. Very important job. Uh, the Army was always trying to move that research and engineering outf uh, outfit out of uh, the arsenal and move it down to uh, New Jersey. It was the worst thing in the world can do. So Fran actually was part of the fight to keep that research and engineering at the arsenal along with a, uh, a man who uh, was, I, I called Mr. Arsenal, as Fred Class. They worked very close together in keeping that organization at the arsenal. And it really is a very important that they work together because they develop all the new weapon systems for the Army. And uh, they developed a lot of the, the manufacturing procedures that gave life, long life to these cannons when they produce them. And when you put them out in the field, you don't want them to blow up. And that was one of his jobs to make sure that didn't happen. Uh, I know some of the, the procedures that they developed at the arsenal, like the swaging process that was developed by the engineers, uh, gave extended life to a tube and they were able to uh, take a lot more stock off of it, make it lighter so it's not that heavy to transport. And the, the rotary forge was a, was a big project they had there where they took an ingot and actually formed a, a, a cannon out of it. And that saved a lot of machining because of the way it was done. So Fran did make a very important contribution to the, to the Army, yet even though he was out of the, of the active part of it. And I certainly uh, worked very close with him when I became the chief of manufacturing because if my machinist gooped up and did something, made a cut too deep in, a, in one of the tubes, it was always one of his people that come up and looked at it and told me whether we're going to scrap a $50,000 tube out or we're able to still use it safely. So I appreciated everything that organization did while I was at the arsenal. And I certainly am going to miss uh, Fran. I, I did see him at church uh, even after he retired and, and I retired. And, I, and his wife here, Teresa, they've been married 61 years. It would have been married 61 years a month after uh, he had passed. And I, I just went by my 60th a week before that, so we're close together on it. So, uh, would uh, any of the family like to say something? Say something. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. I want to thank the legislature for this is a honor. This is a something great to bestow on my mom, our father, our father-in-law, our grandfather, and it's much appreciated. This has been a difficult summer, and uh, I appreciate the chance to to share a little bit and uh, to know that people like Tom everywhere have similar experiences with my dad. He was not. Uh, my brother spoke very eloquently at his funeral about my father's intelligence, his strength, his wit, his humility, and his generosity. He would never have sought any type of recognition for his own contributions, but he would have very much appreciated 
this recognition of the contributions that he valued the most. And they were family and sports and celebrating other people. My dad was very proud of all of us, most of my mom, but proud of his kids and his grandchildren, and he bragged about our accomplishments to, uh, to anyone, and he in general truly enjoyed celebrating the successes of others. He was a, a central figure uh, in the community, which I think we really don't even know the scope of yet. Sports was always an integral part of the family. Uh, both my parents were, were athletes in high school, and uh, my dad played college basketball at Lehigh. And uh, I think as we get older, we talk to multi-kid families like the Zottos and the, the Fennett of the Fennities, right? The, uh, the McGox and the Johnsons and the Phillips, and we are just starting to learn how important our parents were to youth sports in, in the community. We took it for granted when we were kids, but as I realize now that there have been thousands of children who benefited from their efforts back then. And our parents were always they're at all of our sports events, even when they're doubled up and tripled up, they've gone out of state. Uh, I don't know if they've gone out of the country for events, but they've, they were always there. And we've all got fun stories about them. I'll just tell you one short one. When I was a little, I was a freshman, I was still very little, and played basketball, and I was so small I couldn't reach the hoop from the foul line unless I shot underhand really hard, and I never made foul shots. And there came a game when we were down, classic, two seconds left, we're down by one point and I got fouled shooting. And my whole team groaned, because that was pretty much it. And I'm like, oh, and my, I worked on it and I got to the foul line and I concentrated and I shot one ball up and sure enough it went right in, tie game, and then the next one I shot went right in and we won the game. And the first thing I did was look over at my dad and he was doubled up laughing so hard he was crying. <laughs> and then he, he looked at me and he just shook his head and went, <laughs> and we all have, have those stories. He taught us that you should work hard and take what you do seriously, but not take yourself seriously. And he taught us to not to do the best more than anyone, but to be our best, not necessarily to be the best. He taught us to respect other people, to respect positions, and to value the individual <coughs> contributions of everyone. And, it's Tom, and he lived his life like that. There are people at the arsenal will still talk about how even with the high position that he had, he would walk through the shops, he would talk to people as an educator. He explained things to everyone in language they could understand. And I remember when he retired, people were genuinely sad that he was going to be leaving. And I remember looking at the people. I looked at my family and I thought, how lucky we are. We, get, we still get to have him. We get to have him every day. And I really I felt that. And we have had him for a long time. And uh, as we go forward, as you can imagine, the holiday season is going to be a bit difficult. But this, this resolution reminds us again that my father impacted more people than we know. And not only do we have our own stories, but as we get through this time, we're going to be comforted, I think, again and again by stories we have yet to hear of people who appreciated him and his impact. So I really thank you for kind of cementing this and getting us off to a good start for the holiday season. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. And she kind of followed in her father's footsteps. She works at the Arsenal, too. How many years you got now? I'll share it here, 29. 29 years, wow. <laughs> Actually, I, when I was a supervisor in Brunswick, I hired her uh, part-time there to, to uh, advise us on uh, labor negotiations because I was doing a contract at the time and I was very stubborn, as you can tell you, on signing the contract because I wanted some things in there that they didn't want, so. It was good. Yeah. Yeah, we should have. That, that it was for their benefit, that really. But anyway, uh, would any other legislators like to say anything? Okay.